speak here today, and I really feel blessed to have this opportunity. Before I begin, though, I would like to thank Dr. Joshua Mason for his support throughout this research process. His guidance and encouragement have been incredibly valuable to me as I pursued this research. So if we could just take a minute. If we take apart and stretch the genetic material in even one tiny cell, we would be looking at six feet of material. Each cell contains about 100,000 genes. Now consider that there are over 37 trillion cells that compose an individual human, and the complexity of the human body becomes mind-boggling. The field of genetics is rapidly expanding. The information that we can obtain from DNA is valuable. Genes and the laws of heredity operate to code who we are at the simplest structural level and then combine to create the entire structure of each individual. The power associated with the ability to understand genetics is both frightening and awe-inspiring. People use shredders to safeguard their bank account numbers and prevent important documents from falling into the wrong hands. Yet, those same individuals could be giving away the rights to their complete genetic code with the click of a button. This presentation will look at the effects of US policy on genetic testing and the trade in genetic information and associated scientific research, its impact on privacy and human rights in Florida and worldwide. Genetic testing is far from an elusive field that is difficult to tap into. In fact, genetic testing is readily available through test kits that can be purchased online or in some local stores for genealogical and informational purposes without any diagnostic application. Genetic tests can be used to determine the haplogroups associated with either the Y chromosome or the mitochondrial DNA and can potentially indicate where an individual's ancestors come from geographically along with what diseases or conditions may potentially affect that person. Now, it's important to point out a relatively common misconception in which people think that a single saliva sample does not contain anything worthwhile. The reality is quite the opposite. Every cell on the swab carries the individual's complete DNA sequence. Peter Pitts of the Center for Medicine in the Public Interest said, it's the most valuable thing you own. This is just the beginning of why it is crucial to be fully informed. So, Let's delve a little deeper into how people might be unknowingly giving their genetic information away to a corporation, and worse, even spending money for them to take it. Consent to the terms and conditions is generally a non-negotiable requirement of the consumer in order for their initial sample to be collected. Language contained in the terms and conditions may be subject to change and the consumer may bear the burden of continually researching the changes and their effects. Even scarier, Hank Greeley, director of the Center for Law and the Biosciences at Stanford School of Medicine, said, if they don't follow it, the chance you would ever find out is very, very low. Privacy rights and property rights associated with genetic testing are not clearly defined. The results of the test are digitized by the provider. This raises issues about internet safety in regard to the stored information, as well as what becomes of the actual sample. The results of the test are stored by the provider, and what becomes of the sample is also largely left up to the provider. Technological advances and the manner in which the data is stored could leave the data subject to breach and the consumer vulnerable. According to the Council for Responsible Genetics, however, these test kit companies use reference populations of relatively small groups of contemporary people to represent historical populations without accounting for migrations, thus calling into question the veracity of the test results themselves. The databases appear to be the property of the respective companies involved, so their validity has not been examined by the scientific community at large unlike the results of the Human Genome Project. The right to privacy, 
although not specifically mentioned in the United States Constitution, is protected under the Fourth Amendment, which reads in part, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizure. Furthermore, privacy surrounding personal information can also be derived from the Fifth Amendment, right to be free from self-incrimination, possibly proving relevant if health information is disclosed to third parties by the test kit providers. While the Ninth Amendment states that the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage other rights retained by the people, it leaves the courts some additional latitude for interpretation. Let's not forget freedom of belief either, which is found in the First Amendment, and although appearing tangential on the surface, this could potentially impact a person whose sample is used for purposes that conflict with their beliefs, limiting their recourse or ability to opt out. How contract law would deal with unanticipated or unknown at the time of consent usage of the genetic information or material might showcase some nimble legal maneuvering on both sides of the question. Congress passed the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act of 2008 to prohibit discrimination on the basis of genetic information with respect to health insurance and employment. Since science can predict which individuals may be more likely to develop a disease, individuals with that knowledge can take provisions to avoid the potential onset of the disease or even tailor treatment options. The information makes an individual more vulnerable to discrimination, and this act is a way of preventing employers and insurers from doing just that. The potential for abuse could also carry over to groups who have a higher likelihood of certain conditions. Possible legislation could limit GINA even further. The question remains, does GINA go far enough? This is something to think about as we explore further. The Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, or HIPAA, speaks to the use and disclosure of individuals' health information and standards for individuals' privacy rights to understand and control how their health information is used. Additionally, the Office for Civil Rights has responsibility for implementing and enforcing the privacy rule with respect to voluntary compliance activities and civil money penalties. In essence, the rule is designed to be flexible so that it can cover both use and privacy and sets forth the standards for the electronic exchange, privacy, and security of health information, becoming the privacy rule, which came out at the end of 2002 and applies to health plans, healthcare clearinghouses, and to any healthcare provider who transmits health information in the electronic form. On the surface, it looks like test kit providers should fall within this rule, but the definitions that determine the terms appear to leave them out of the covered entities since they do not fit into those three terms or the collective term business associate who assists any of the previously mentioned three. Once a consumer has their results from a genetic test, a medically authorized test, or a consumer-based genetic test, if anything indicates a predisposition to a certain disease or condition, failing to disclose that information in response to a cleverly worded insurance question might be considered fraud. On a more troubling note, a bill titled H.R. 1313, the Preserving Employee Wellness Programs Act, if passed, could subject employees who choose not to participate in screenings to pay up to 30% of the cost of their insurance premium. The bill is opposed by the American Society of Human Genetics because, in their opinion, it would undermine the privacy provisions of the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act, effectively making people choose between their privacy and the cost of their coverage. The bill skirts the privacy rights given in GINA by allowing employers access to information from genetic tests 
if they were conducted as part of a wellness program. The issue of familial search should also be mentioned. When law enforcement does not get a match in its own databases for DNA they have collected from crime scenes, in some cases, they can gain access to other databases to connect the DNA to close family members of the potential perpetrator. Four states so far have passed familial search laws. California, Colorado, New York, and Florida. Nine states, including these four, allow it. Maryland has taken the opposite approach and banned it. As such, the decision to get tested could impact others in your family. Now here's the ultimate question. What should the consumer do? The first thing is to recognize that the consumer has options. One option is to wait and see what comes from Democratic Senator Chuck Schumer of New York, asking the Federal Trade Commission to take a serious look at this relatively new kind of service and ensure that these companies can have clear, fair privacy policies. Here is an elected official openly acknowledging the Wild West nature of this industry. Another option, in the meantime, is to read through the terms and conditions with a fine-tooth comb and understand exactly what could happen with your DNA. Then ask yourself if you really do accept those terms. In 2015, a study looked at the privacy policies of 228 of these types of companies that offer medical genetics, paternity, and ancestry DNA services, and found them to be more focused on the use of cookies on their respective websites, rather than the data involved with the test. Only 10% said that the sample is destroyed immediately after sequencing, or after communicating test results. In the past, terms and conditions were very broad in favor of the company. Despite claiming that customers retain ownership of their DNA, unless an individual specifically informs them otherwise, the company actually keeps the information. According to a genetic test kit board member, the long game is not to make money selling kits, but instead is the data they uncover that allows them to become the Google of personalized healthcare. These companies get the data that could bring enormous profits, while the consumer gets test results that are potentially questionable according to the Council for Responsible Genetics, and inconsistent health information regarding medical conditions, as noted by the Journal of the American Medical Association. The Federal Trade Commission recommends comparison shopping in regard to which companies offer the best privacy rights, as well as carefully choosing what options are acceptable to you. Genetic testing does have many merits, however, including learning about your background, potential health issues, and helping foster continuing scientific research. In summation, at-home genetic testing is not without its merits. However, the unchartered territory associated with releasing your genetic code to a corporation should not be overshadowed by the excitement and fascination associated with finding out about your lineage. Third-party companies that have access to your genetic information may be able to make wonderful scientific and medical advancements based on what they learned from your DNA. However, there is ambiguity in laws, terms, and conditions that are subject to change at any time and the potential for your DNA to be sold and transmitted to third-party entities. 
Additionally, the digitized method of storing DNA utilized by the corporations is not immune from hacking, and intentional misuse is not completely out of the question, given that, as Hank Greeley said, the chance you would ever find out is very, very low. Therefore, as we wait for further clarification in the area of public policy and more transparency from the corporations themselves, the best thing we can do is be informed consumers. With one click, these companies will know your entire genetic code. So while on your quest to learn more about yourself, make sure you save some time to learn more about them too. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Were there any questions? Okay. Well, in that case, I'll. Oh, you have one? Yeah, of course. The delivery is very clear. Thank you. So Thank you. Have, you weren't showing the top pixel all over the game because it's a little long, even though it's a title. The top of your research. Oh, the title. Sure. Well, I can, I can read it to you. But I can. Just as everybody had a chance to get to know. Yeah. I can just go back. There we go. Is that okay? Inspired by some reason, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. go and research uh, deep information, or how do you embark on this research topic? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And actually, I started this research from a consumer standpoint because I thought this kind of product and this kind of service was very interesting. It's something that appealed to me. I think the whole idea of learning about your lineage and potential diseases, I think it's fascinating. And I think it's something that I started looking into for myself, for my family. And I think when I started looking into it from a consumer point of view, it's kind of when I found out that there was so much ambiguity surrounding what happens to it. And anytime you're sending your DNA somewhere to be in somebody else's possession, it seems like I would want to know more about that. So I thought that that's something kind of interesting, and I began looking into it. And then I realized that there are a couple of situations surrounding it that I feel like could use some more clarification. But there are also a lot of advantages. And so it really is a personal decision whether or not you choose to um, choose to subscribe to the service. But I think what's important is to be an informed consumer and think about the advantages in light of all of the different circumstances that could happen and then make that decision. Yeah, of course. Yes. Do you have a um, couple of companies that you looked at that have this genetic information as well? I have looked at numerous companies, and I think that the main problem is there really is no ideal company that handles this following all of the laws because the whole definition of handling it properly is almost a personal choice on its own. Are you okay with your DNA being used in research? Do you consider that a plus? Do you consider your DNA being immediately destroyed a plus? And so I think that it's almost a personal decision, and that's why I included that information from the Federal Trade Commission, because I think they had really good advice when they talked about how you not only need to look at what the company provides you, but also what the company does with your DNA after you, and then almost go through it and see which of the services align with your beliefs about what should happen. Yes. Oh, of course. The slide before FTC as well. I mean, the, I know this is just a, a one maybe year or semester research, mm -hmm. all right? Yes. Uh, you probably an undergraduate student mm -hmm. or PhD student, but from your research experience so far, if you get to like make an impact on policy and public accomplishment, mm -hmm. what would you like to see in terms of more law or less law? In, Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I think what I would push for would really just be standardization because we have a lot, in, a lot of laws in place. I mean, we talked about GINA, we talked about HIPAA, and those are good laws because they're protecting your privacy. But I think also this whole field of genetic testing 
where it's not ordered by a physician, where you can do it at home, where you can buy it at a local store and do it on your own, is almost in a gray area because you're not supervised by a physician, you're not at a center for genetic testing, you're really doing it on your own. And so a lot of the things that I pointed out have to do with the fact that GINA and HIPAA are, are good laws but maybe not encompassing everything with this up and coming area of genetic testing. And so I think it's something that as it becomes more and more prominent should be incorporated into laws more so that we have direct authoritative responses for exactly what should happen. And maybe then it wouldn't be left up to the individual company so much if there were policies that said they had to follow. Yes? It just seems to me an obvious one would be it, as I was listening to your presentation, I'm thinking it ought to be required by law that if they change the terms and conditions, every single consumer, every single person on their list is immediately informed mm -hmm. of the change in the terms con and conditions by the same means of the communication that they use to inform you of everything else. Mm -hmm. Because I, I did it. I am a consumer. Okay. And so I got mm -hmm. kind of outraged by that. And now <laughs> I have to run and see what the deal is. <laughs> I totally understand. And from my research, it seems that most companies do notify people, but then it becomes almost a situation of how frequently are you checking your notifications? If you see a notification that says the terms and conditions have updated, are you opening it? Are you reading it? Are you combing through it to find out exactly what changed and if you still believe it? It's just a bit of getting the message out there. And not only that, but understanding that when you accept the terms and conditions at the initial time that the sample is collected, you have to understand also that they can change that. And once they have your DNA, they have your DNA. Yeah. And so that's something you have to just have to think about in advance. Especially since, and it's, you know, I would like to think that they wouldn't misuse it, but there is that Hank Greeley quote that says, if they did misuse it, you probably wouldn't find out. So it's just something to think about. Once your DNA is out there, it's out there. OK. okay. So I'll just leave you with this quote that I thought was interesting. I think you'll enjoy it. In his book, The Gene, An Intimate History, Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee takes an insightful look at genes and the part they play in our heredity. I was particularly intrigued by a quote he included from Herbert G. Wells's book, Mankind in the Making. This missing science of heredity, this unworked mine of knowledge on the borderline of biology and anthropology, which for all practical purposes is as unworked now as it was in the days of Plato, is in simplest truth 10 times more important to humanity than all of the chemistry and physics, all the technical and industrial science that ever has been or ever will be discovered. Thank you.